thank you for every gift you bestow upon us. We return these gifts and offerings to you, asking your blessing upon them, asking you to make us good stewards and generous givers that we can contribute to the work of the kingdom. We come and make our offering of prayer. In Jesus' name, we taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated and turn to the very end of the book of Judges. The last couple of verses, it's chapter 21, verses 24 and 25. <clears throat> Judges 21. I'm going to kind of bring this little series to an end. Mainly because, and I'm going to summarize some of the bad stuff that's going on here at the end of the book. And it ought to be a tremendous warning to us. But... I just don't know if I could go too closely to this. It's, it's just too saddening. I mean, it's just too, it's too ugly. So why don't we see the last couple of verses here and see uh, that there's some message of good news and hope. But I'm going to summarize this good news and hope comes uh, even in a context where there's sin is running rampant. The last two verses of the book of Judges, chapter 21, verses 24 and 25, Give attention, this is the word of the Lord. At that time, the Israelites left that place and went home to their tribes and clans, each to his own inheritance. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit, or some of your translations may say they did what was right in their own eyes. <clears throat> this ends the reading of God's holy word. Well, a couple weeks ago, this is going through this, we made a transition from the, in the book of Judges where there seemed to be this general pattern of uh, the, the people falling into sin. Um, that rebellion and disobedience was um, looked upon by God uh, and in judgment, really. He hands them over to the domination of the surrounding pagan peoples. And they suffer at the hands of the oppression of those surrounding peoples until the time they cry out. They cry out in desperation, really, not so much repentance. <clears throat> and God in his compassion and his mercy raises up a savior, a deliverer, a judge, these, as they're called here, probably is more than just sitting in judgment uh, with the people and dealing with their disagreements. Uh, but rather was raised up to, to really assert at least regional leadership overall. And so they were brought up, they were strengthened in some way to win a victory over that dominating pagan people to deliver them, and then they were able to live freely. So that was the pattern until we get to chapter 17. And in chapter 17, there was a shift to where it seems like the book of Judges is simply describing um, how bad things had gotten, how sinful uh, even this covenant people of God were behaving. And in chapter 17, we saw how this really unusual story of Micah, okay, shouldn't be confused with Micah the prophet. Micah is a man in the hill country of Ephraim, and we first are introduced to him by him revealing to his mother that he had stolen from her and lied about it. <clears throat> And then she had pronounced a curse on whoever, whoever had taken it and yet then tried to rework it because, you know, it's, it's her own son. And she fashions some of the silver that he returns into an idol. And then we learn that Micah has his own shrine. Really, and very literally, Hebrew would call it a house of gods. Not just, you know, not just this one idol out of silver fashioned in the form. And so that's where we were. And, um, you know, um, I'm not even sure if we got the recording on that. We may have, but uh, essentially, it's saying this: um, that's how bad things were getting. This was a there. Here was an example of just where things would go 
if the word of God, if the law of God was not ruling and there wasn't someone in place who would make sure that the people were living obediently to that law. And so it doesn't seem like a harsh thing, especially in our modern sort of um, postmodernist, pluralistic uh, way of thinking. I know that's not us, but that's the way our world thinks. They think in terms of, well, you know, if that's what floats your boat, then that should be okay. I mean, that's not my thing. I don't really bow down to silver idols. I don't really, our world says they don't really bow down to anything except to their own devices, their own concerns. That's sort of the dominating idolatry of our day. Self is the great idol of our day. I do what I want to do. I'll declare myself to be and act in ways that I declare myself to be an act. That seems to be a prevailing uh, spirit. But when you consider that God was very clear about how, who he was and how he was to be worshipped, this was a serious abomination. <clears throat> uh, Micah even got a Levite who was traveling through and kind of secured him as his own you know, chaplain, if you will. Well, you lead us and my family. Disregarding that there was a place of worship, there was a place of worship in Shiloh and Bethel, there was at least at that point the tabernacle was stationary. That was the place that the Lord was to, to be worshipped. So they were going about it in their own ways. They were doing whatever they, as we just read, what they saw fit. In other words, whatever they decided was the way to do it, that's just what became the standard. Well, it gets worse. Let me summarize. See, there, there's, two th there's the bad news and the good news. I am going to get to the good news because this is the year of the good news, the year of the gospel. But good news is good news because it contrasts the bad news. And the gospel, and the gospel of the Lord Jesus is so good because it is a, it is a message and, it is, and it, the content of it contrasts the really bad news of our sin before God. So what is it? If, if we were to have spent a few weeks and went through these things, what we would have learned, what happened, the, there's three, three events, and let me see if I can summarize them quickly and get to the good news, but at least three events. First was that the Danites, a whole tribe, decided they weren't satisfied with what they ended up with, and they were going to go out and they were going to find them some more land, a different place. And so in chapter 18, you're going to learn of the Danites, okay, that tribe, one of the sons of Israel, Dan, and those descendants at this point in history, they were going to go out and do that. And they, you'll see, it's almost reminiscent of, of the Exodus when they identified some spies to send into the Promised Land. They send out some warriors to spy out some land and some places. And so in the course of their travels, they meet Micah and his Levite. And then they go on and they find out that there's this, there's this place that's sort of secluded uh, there in uh, Ephraim sort of moving northern uh, in a northern direction to scope out any land that they could conquer and take for themselves and settle. And they find out there's this unsuspecting place called Laish, L-A-I-S-H. And the spies come back and they tell all that's there. And they even, they even request some divine direction, you know, from the Levite. And they believe that they're getting the go-ahead from the Lord himself. And so they come back and convince their people, oh yeah, we, it's a good land, there's good things, and there's an unsuspecting people, we believe we should go and take it. It's ours for the taking. It's good for the picking here. Let's go. So they go. And along the way, they, just, they realize, some of them said, you know what? We met this Levite who was, who was leading a people over here in, this hill, in the hill country. Um, you know, why don't we go and just get him and get us? So they go and they confront Micah, the Levite. They actually hire the Levite away from him, take him as their own. He's, he's, uh, he's open for the highest bidder, so he takes, he, he's in good shape here. He gets, gets taken care of. And they also just take all the, the, all the idols and they leave. Micah don't like that too much, so he gathers some of his people and he says, let's track them down and let's get our stuff back. The only problem was is Micah didn't have nearly enough. The Danites who approached him, there were about 600 fighting men, warriors, and there wasn't enough of his. And so they say, oh, so you want to so you want to take your stuff back, huh? He says, yeah, it's mine. Why don't you give it back to me? And they say, well, I'll tell you what, you better think about this because we've got some really hotheads among our number, and I think they're probably going to take you out. 
So Micah thought about that for a minute, and he says, you know, it's probably true. We're outnumbered. Um, this is not going to be any good. I'm probably going to die if we pursue this. So you know what? We, pray, we better just cut our losses and go back home. So he goes back, leaves them. They pursue on, they continue on with their Levite now, their official priest who can serve them well, they think, and these idols. And they're going to move forward. And they come upon this unsuspecting people in Laish and they just overwhelm them. They put them to the sword, they cut them down, and they take over. <clears throat> and they resettle in a different place. That is what was going on at this particular time among the descendants of Israel, Jacob. This, that is the kind of activity that was prevailing. That was the type of thing that they were entering into. Is it supposed to turn our stomach? Absolutely. I think that's the very reason it's told to us. This, among God's covenant people, that they would abuse and take advantage of and exploit their own, and they would go and brutally conquer their own people. To take, yeah, that's, that's what was going on. So that's the first event you would read about. What else? Secondly, now, I think this is a different Levite and concubine, so you can't get confused. It sort of shifts stories here. And in chapter 19, you hear this other interesting story of a Levite who has a concubine. Now, it's almost matter of fact the way it talks about his concubine. Now, it doesn't matter how you cut it. A concubine was not the legitimate and official wife of this person. Could have been a secondary wife. Could have been a servant. <clears throat> and it just kind of describes it. That's most of what this is, this is. It's not telling us anything about what ought to be. There's no prescription in this. It's really just describing really just how sinful sin can be. And the Levite, the one who is supposed to be a person fulfilling and being part of that tribe that serves Israel by serving God, <clears throat> leading them in understanding things, is a concubine. And it says this concubine, perhaps because she was fed up with being a secondary, secondary person, she committed adultery, and then she just left him and went back to her father's home in Bethlehem. He was also in the uh, hill country of Ephraim. So after a while, the Levite, though, says, you know, you know she's still my concubine. I'm going to go get her. And so he goes to Bethlehem, and he tries to get back his concubine from the father. The father, at least, is accepting of it, and he wants to go back, but he delays them. He wants to do favorable things for the Levite, so perhaps maybe he won't be harsh with her or something like that, but he's glad for her to have another place to live and be supported, but he uh, goes on with it. And he delays them by asking one more day, one more day, one more day. They finally get on their trip, and he's going to take her back to the hill country of Ephraim, and they're going through their travels. And in the course of this time they had been delayed, they come to a city called Gabeah. And in Gabeah, they could not find anybody to take them in. There were no places of, um, uh, you know, of lodging or whatever. And if folks did not take you in, then you sort of stayed at the city square, at the gate, and wherever, in a public place. And there's an old man who comes along, and he doesn't like it. He's actually from another tribe, but he's living there. And he says, you know, you need to come with me, and I'll provide for you. The Levite says, well, we've got our own provisions, and we can handle this. No, no, you need to come with me. I think because he knew that they were living in a city of depravity. So he takes the Levite and concubine, and he says, and it doesn't take long until you find out that Gabeah could probably be called New Sodom. They're knocking on the door, and the men of the town know that there's some visitors, and they say, you need to serve up your, 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 uh, your guests for us to have our way with them. And so the old man's like, listen, you know, this is, this is an abominable thing. We shouldn't do this. How about you take... You know, how about you take my virgin daughter? And then the Levite offered up his concubine. And so instead of facing what that community wanted to do, uh, you know, with them, they hand over. And the concubine is handed over. And it says, I know, throughout the night she was abused by these people. Abused to the degree that she barely makes it back to the home. Her arms are clutching the doorposts. And by the time the Levite opens the door the next morning, she has died. The Levite, sort of matter-of-factly, picks her up, puts her, carries her on to where they traveled, and in his anger, he decides, 
this shouldn't happen. It's almost like, you know, we're not even thinking about the Levite's sins at this point. We're thinking about all this other stuff. And he decides he's going to, pardon me, by the way, this is not, this is not rated G. He dismembers the concubine, cuts her up into pieces and sends it out in an official communication to the different tribes. They see this and they go, nothing like this. I mean, just as gruesome as it sounds to us, it was gruesome to them. Nothing like this has ever happened in Israel. What in the world is going on? So they gather in a place called Mizpah and they send their delegates and they gather to figure out what's going on and the Levite tells them what happened. Sort of selectively telling them how awful she had been treated by these people and rousing the crowd against the Benjamites of Gabeah. The Benjamites are called out. The Benjamites come and say, well, we don't like it that all y'all are piling up on the Gabeans. We're on their side. We're going to defend them. So as you keep reading, you find out basically this whole episode leads into a massive civil war, if you want to call it that. One of the worst terms to ever be used, really. There's nothing civil about any kind of war. And maybe it's even, it's even worse when it's, you know, when, when we're looking at it here among God's people. So you see that it goes on and you continue and you find out that the Benjamites outnumbered dramatically at least win some early battles, but it doesn't take long till Israel, the, the major part of them, they not only defeat them, but they, they, they cut them down very seriously to the degree that they really are fearful after it's over that Benjamin cannot recover from this. The tribe basically is going to be lost because they killed me. That's what's happening among God's people. Levites taking concubines, handing them over to be abused by depraved people, perverse people. And then using that as a way to stir up trouble, which then escalates into this major civil war in which one tribe is almost completely obliterated. Now, it gets, it gets even better if you want to see how... How, boy, it continues. They grieve, actually, over the loss that Benjamin has suffered. And they say, what is going on here? We have now, we have now, we're almost, we have essentially eliminated one of the tribes. This shouldn't be. We need to do something. But we've all taken an oath that we will not give any of our daughters over to Benjamites, whoever may be left. And so they have to come up with a plan to help figure out a way in which Benjamin as a tribe can be restored. So what do they do? They use their depraved, sinful scheming to figure out, oh, wait a minute. When we gathered at one time, Jabesh Gilead, you know, they refused to come. So, you know, they certainly shouldn't be under this oath that we have made. In fact, part of their punishment ought to be the fact that they are not doing anything. So there's an attack on Jabesh Gilead. They slaughter everybody except for the virgins. Okay, there's, there's some. We can hand these over to the Benjamites, but it's not nearly enough. So we've got to have some other way to find, to find wives so that they can reproduce and build back their tribe. You know, there is that annual feast that they have near Shiloh and Bethel, probably the Feast of Tabernacles. They didn't even identify it. And you know, when they are celebrating, it could be that the women there will be unsuspecting as they go out. So to the Benjamites, they were helped in this plot to go and to abduct the women who were unsuspecting at the feast. And to take them, take them away. Is there, you know, have you, have, you been, have you been nervous about all this talk about human trafficking? Do, do you get those little messages from people you know saying, hey, you know, we're hearing there's people prowling around at certain places. Now, whether they're true or not, it has us in a stir, right? We're concerned about it. And those of us who have daughters, we're definitely, in a, we're definitely concerned. That's what was happening among God's people. Planned human trafficking, basically. Abducting people, taking them off somewhere. That's the bad news. That's how bad it was during this time. That's how bad it was. A people that should have seen and read and learned what the law of God demanded of them, they were obviously living in this horribly depraved and debased, they had a debased mind. They, they, they weren't being governed at all. And so we come to the very end where it says, In those days, 
In those days, Israel had a... Now, here's the thing. If it's that bad, it seems like God would have said, enough of this, enough of this, and just do away with his people. But it says, notice, here. now here's where the good news starts. In those days, there was no king. You see what that implies? What that's suggesting? This is being put together after the fact at a time when there was a king, talking about how bad it was when there wasn't a king in order to help edify and teach the people of their history as a warning against it. But do you see the good news of that? God didn't abandon them. God didn't hand them over. He didn't bring a decisive judgment to, to do them in. He continued in mercy and grace to deal with His people and bring them to a time in which He would, in fact, bring righteousness to bear, especially once He put His man in place, King David in particular. In those days, in those days, we, we find out soon after this, if we were to combine Judges and keep going through Ruth and 1 Samuel, but in 1 Samuel in particular, we finally have, who, who probably was the final judge, was Samuel. He was raised up. Now this was a man of true righteousness. This was a man who was truly a prophet of God who would go and declare it. And by the time you get to 1 Samuel 3, 19 and 21, after all this happens, you read these words that says, The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh and there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. We finally are going to move through all this sin and yuck and muck among God's people. God is going to raise up somebody who will be a true prophet and proclaim this word. And then eventually he's going to anoint a king. God's mercy was still present even while his people had fallen so deeply into sin and it was ruling them. It was dominating them. That's the God we serve. A, a God who is slow to anger, who is willing in his mercy to work with his people. And then, of course, they had no king <clears throat> suggests that, well, there would be a king coming. And in the book of Ruth, you know, a few years ago I did did a few sermons on, on Ruth. But there's the section right at the end that we tend to overlook. We love the sort of the twists and turns of God's providence bringing Ruth and Boaz together. But when they finally are brought together, we see this genealogy at the end. So Ruth, widowed at an early age, brings Naomi, goes with her back to Israel. Naomi is bitter. She don't think anything good is going to come. But Boaz, a kinsman redeemer, does the things necessary to bring Ruth in as his wife. And he also brings in Naomi, the mother-in-law to make sure they're provided for. But they have a child. The product of that union gets to this place. At the end of the book of Ruth, it says, So Boaz and Ruth, and uh, she became his wife. Then he went to her, and the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. The women said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who is this day has not left you without a kinsman redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons, has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child, laid him in her lap, and cared for him. The women, li uh, the women living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. You think there's just this neat little love story about bringing two people together after tragedy. And then at the end you find out, wait a minute. This is how the Lord was working to prepare us for the great king after his own heart. God hadn't given up. He hadn't brought decisive judgment. He was still in his mercy preparing to do something even with his sinful depraved people. That's what you learn at the end of Judges. We're not talking about just sinners. We're talking about sinner sinners. I mean, we're talking, the stuff I was describing, we're talking about the worst kinds of things were going on. And that's where sin was leading them. And yet in God's mercy, he was still planning to do something with his people. In providing them a prophet, and providing them a king, and King David. That's the God we serve. He's not quick and ready to go and condemn and, and do away with us. He is ready to save and deliver and sanctify us for his name's sake. 
That's ultimately what Judges teaches us. Because if he was ready to do them in, he would have done them in a long time ago. There's a lot of long-suffering with the Lord, dealing with the sinful people until he brings about his redeeming purposes and his covenantal blessing. And that's the hope you and I have too in Christ. As we come to this table today, as we're eating and drinking, it should tell us God loves you and His mercy. He's redeemed you in Christ and He is imparting the sweet blessings of this gospel to you through faith in Him. With that, I'm going to ask the elders to come forward, prepare the table, and let us come and commune with Christ our Savior.